Hello again, everyone out there. Thanks for joining us on this episode of The Next Show. And it is an extremely exciting episode because I am here with Loretta Tioila, and she is here to talk to us about synthetic biology. Now, if you're anything like me, you don't know much about synthetic biology. You're a complete beginner. We are going to find out all about it thanks to Loretta. So Loretta, thank you so much for joining us on The Next Show. How are you? Great, amazing. Thank you. Thank you. The event has been so far amazing. So very happy to be here. That is great to hear. And is it your first time in Hamburg? Yes. It is. Yes. Exciting. I enjoy the city. <laughs> but before yes. you run out and enjoy the city, let's talk about synthetic biology. As I said, and I'm thinking that many people watching this will be in a similar position. I am a complete beginner when it comes to synthetic biology. I know that it's about, thanks to you and what I've read about you, I know that it's about the convergence of the life sciences and computation. These two huge powerful forces are now converging and that has all kinds of exciting implications and it has all kinds of risks that we can talk about. But let's start right at the beginning. What is synthetic biology? What is it all about and how did you become involved in it? Yeah, for sure. Um, the principles beyond synthetic biology are pretty simple. Uh, it's about the idea of applying engineering logic to actually um, life system and life science in general. So if you really think about the way that we've been doing research up until so far, we've been doing it in a very iterative way where basically we have identified, we are investigating actually diseases by running experiments. But uh, in that process, it means that we are groping in the dark uh, because we are waiting for the feedbacks and the lesson learned out of these experiments to then know what to do next. Where should we investigate next? What should be, what do we understand out of these lessons and observations? And it means that this is a very iterative process that can sometimes lead us nowhere or take generally a lot of time. Now, the idea of synthetic biology is about actually changing that paradigm by saying, now we think that we have the technology at our disposal to actually take the knowledge that we have and use it as a way where we're going to see life as build, build, with building block. And this building block, we're going to use them and modify them to reprogram life. And so if you really think about it, this is kind of what we have done with the COVID-19 vaccine, because we already knew about the mechanism associated with RNA, but we took that knowledge to actually use it to change the initial purpose that was given by life, to turn it into a machine to produce, you know, the antibody that we're going to be helping into the fight against the virus. And so synthetic is all about that. It's about modifying already existing as the organism, as a mechanism that exists in life right now to change its original purpose to achieve something. And so that means that it can be applied to pretty much everything that human beings use or consume. And so that goes from drugs and therapeutics for fighting diseases, but to fighting actually issues on food and agriculture, where you can actually change the way that you produce actually, you know, product to the way that we actually uh, just dress yourself. So for example, changing the way that we produce fabrics to have them actually, you know, bioengineer by snails or using mushrooms to develop textiles. So it touches everything actually. And that's why it's a very important actually technology that is going to disrupt life as we know it right now. It's absolutely fascinating. Now a band has just taken the stage downstairs, I think. I, I don't know if the viewers can hear the music, but it is testament to the fact that it is a non-stop party <laughs> at the next conference, but we will nevertheless keep talking. Fascinating what you said about the, the coronavirus vaccine and is the computation part of this? And these are very beginner questions, I know. But like I say, I think many of the viewers will be beginners too. Is the computation part of this that we are using computation, maybe even using AI to remake these building blocks and to allow us to do that much faster than we than, we, than we could have done before? Yeah, yeah is, that, is that right? Yeah, definitely. If you really think about it, um, 
you know, things have evolved at a very rapid pace over the last past 10 to 20 years. I'm not very young, so I remember when the Human Genome Project actually started. And, you know, it was forecasted that it was going to last 10, 20 years before we can accomplish that. And now, in the span of one to two months after the coronavirus has been actually officially discovered, we were able to have a pretty good overview of its genetic actually mapping. And that's just due to the fact that computational tools have actually moved so fast that right now we are able to do what used to take us five to 10 years into a matter of weeks, months. And that is the power of it. But you, if you really think about it, as I was explaining uh, when I started, it's all about experiments. And so by design, life science are actually a very data intense, actually, discipline, because at its core is the fact that for each experiment is are going to be ton of data, ton of information. Now, the issue and maybe it's the challenge, but also the opportunity is the fact that before, at even right now, up until right now, and I think it will continue for some time. The way that we approach, the way that we get the, extract this information out of this experiment is very uh, analogical in the sense that it's always human interface based, meaning you have a researcher, a scientist that is going to be the one in charge of actually recording into a notebooks every aspect of the experiments, like how many mil millimeter of this, of this he has put together to actually produce what he was trying to produce, what has been observed. But it's always subjective and it's always faulty because it's it rely on one human being. Of course, Scientists have their own hunch, and so they have the ability also to give this kind of insight and input that a machine might not necessarily actually be able to see. But still, it's analogical. That means that these data are not captured in a way or form that can be transmitted automatically to a computing system that then can start working its magic. And so the whole challenge about computation right now and merge with biology is really the interface where you want to take away actually uh, everything that is done by human that can be done in a better way by machine. And that's why in labs right now, you have this huge trend in terms of automatization where labs are actually being highly automatized because when you do that, then suddenly all of the acquisition of the information is actually digitalized straight away. And therefore that means that you can in the process in live actually change your operations. So if you are a new manufacturer, you can produce liters and liters automatically. And then if you need to change maybe the temperature, because you have noticed that this temperature may be the optimal one, you can do it instantaneously. Yeah. So this is the kind of progress that we're doing. Yeah, and I guess the pandemic was an incredible watershed moment for synthetic biology because at a global scale. I mean, it was your go-to example, and it's a brilliant example for introducing this topic. You know, we saw at a global scale the power and the impact that synthetic biology can have in allowing us to create a vaccine in a matter of months yeah. for a pathogen that was completely new. That is an astonishing feat. It is, it is, because traditionally, um, pharmaceutical companies has always uh, been um, in this trend where developing a drug or any kind of therapeutics is something that is very time intensive. Generally, it takes seven, eight, even 10 years before something goes into production. And most of them actually, even when they reach the production status, are actually most of the time not actually fully operational or functional or useful to the end user. And so it costs billions of dollars actually to represent 20% of revenue for each pharmaceutical company to put actually that kind of info into, into motion. And so the, the, the pandemic has this, you know, positive highlight of showing that First, we have the technical ab ability to do it now when things come, you know, to dire hands. And secondly, it's a matter of what is our priority. And it showed that. It also showed that uh, what we used to take for granted and what we didn't use to invest in from the investment perspective now need to be invested more. Because pre-pandemic, when you were talking about life science, only generic, I would say, um, only specialist investor would want to actually um, topple into that. But now you mm -hmm. have that mm -hmm. kind of 
consciousness that has emerged that among the things that we should care about as you know getting an iphone or you know watching like netflix there is also oh am i healthy and it's better it's like am i healthy comes as a first question now not the other way around and so it's kind of resetted a little bit our mindset about what should be considered as important or not yeah yeah and and has it also i mean let's talk about your involvement in the synthetic biology space tell us about my understanding is that you are establishing a, a kind of open platform an open computing platform for synthetic biology tell us about that and 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 what that is and how it works and i'm guessing that the pandemic has also fueled momentum and maybe even investment towards this space. Yeah, yeah. So you, you were asking about the story earlier. Yeah. So um, for me, it started um, um, a couple of years ago, pre-pandemic, actually. I'm a computer scientist by training. I spent the last past 10 to 12 years doing a computing. I went from the pre-cloud uh, area to doing cloud computing and doing AI. And five years ago, I wanted to specialize in biotech more specifically and the application of AI in biotech. Now, I, I had a very clear objective in mind at that time. I, I wanted to actually uh, use AI in biotech, but in specifically in neuroscience. Uh, because of personal history, I'm very interested into the dynamic of violence. Uh, as I see it as um, uh, a virus in itself that just spread itself. And so I was interested in just searching into that and how basically applying AI could be used to rewire the brain. Now, from that, I started to work with a startup uh, based in Paris that were working on Alzheimer's disease. And what they were doing was fairly straightforward. They were actually using blood sample and analyzing uh, the biomarkers into these blood samples to tell you 10 years ahead if you were going to develop the Alzheimer's disease, which is very important because most of the issue with Alzheimer is the late diagnostic. And so, I was coming in as a computer scientist here to help to design the algorithm that will be, be able to support this kind of predictions. But very quickly, what occurs to me was the data set was no good. From a scientific computer scientist perspective, that was no data set, basically. And I started to realize that that was not actually a one startup issue. That was basically a systemic issue because these biotech startups, they were actually with pharmaceutical companies, with CROs, uh, with clinicians to get the data because they are most of the time not necessarily the one generating the data. The data are coming from patients. The data are coming actually from clinical trials, etc. So it's coming from everywhere into the ecosystem. And so they are at the receive receiving end and so for me as a computer scientist if i wanted to fix that or help fixing it i needed to go back to the source and so i moved away from um, that to actually focus on getting closer to the one that we're actually generating the data and that was just short of a couple of months before actually covid hit and of course when covid hit uh, everyone just posed and we focused on the fight against COVID. How can we actually use our skill set to actually help the scientists get the data at one single spot? And so while we were doing that, I realized that I, w I wanted to fix a problem. So the problem was the, the right one, but the way that I was going about it was the wrong one, wrong way to go about it. Because I'm a technologist, the way I naturally uh, occurred to me was to say, okay, I'm going to build a platform because that's what I know what, what to do and how to do it. But I realized it's not about me building a one size fits all platform because first, this is very naive. It's never going to work because you cannot address all the different corner and use cases that life science actually hold within itself with one platform. The, the need of a, an oncologist for fighting cancer is not the same as the one trying to develop a diagnostic device for Alzheimer's, definitely not. So I actually step away from that idea of building a platform, but I moved it to, oh, I need to build the ecosystem. But always keeping in mind that what I had to bring to the table was actually my expertise and my knowledge uh, in computing. And so for me, the way to go about it was to say, okay, what I see is missing is we don't have one entity that allow for computer scientists, but also licensed researcher to come together. Because what I could see is like, Life scientists, uh, life science scientists, they need actually to learn more about computing. 
because um, these tools are actually amazing tools that they could be using to actually fast forward their research, but they don't know how to use it and because they have no way to get easy access to that and they don't want to, to, to become computer scientists. This is our just tool. They want to be able to use it to fulfill the purpose, which is actually making great research. And so ENS Blossom, the idea of building a computing foundation, the same as some the computing foundation that you and I know, the Linux foundation, that were, you know, at the core of producing all this open, amazing open source, you know, software that has helped actually build everything that we know right now from the, uh, I would say, high technology company. And so I mimic that idea by saying, okay, if we have a computing foundation dedicated to life science, specifically to synthetic biology, then we can actually foster an ecosystem that is going to blossom and that you know ecosystem will be at the root of creating everything that is needed to actually make sure that we're moving to that next stage that i can see happening and so this is how open Symbio was actually born and fast forward to last year we had more than 300 startups that were actually aligning with this idea of you know becoming more data centric, becoming more uh, computer oriented, but not for the sake of it, but for the, the purpose of doing better research, faster research, actually. Yeah, amazing. So you want to be the ecosystem of platforms, the, the, the ecosystem that brings all these different players together. Yeah. Do you think that synthetic biology can help us solve some of the biggest, most serious health challenges we face? you know, in the 21st century. You mentioned Alzheimer's, clearly that's one, Alzheimer's and dementia. Cancer, of course, will be the one, another one that people turn to. Can it even help us address aging itself? Are these the kinds of areas that, that, that the players in this ecosystem are looking at? It is, definitely. It is at the core of what uh, people in synthetic biology actually do. Right now, in our ecosystem, we have uh, people working on climate change, even on climate change. So for example, I like to, to mention that startup because I think this is one of the most amazing startups that I've met over the last couple of months. It's a startup that actually is using plants to actually produce electric vehicle battery. Now, the natural response would say, plants producing electric vehicle <laughs> battery, that's insane. But actually, no, it's not because Plants actually have a very basic mechanism. They're actually sucking out, you know, minerals out of the soil and then they're using it uh, into the leaves actually to just, you know, produce uh, the air and everything that we need. They ab absorb the CO2 and that's a very healthy mechanism that we, uh, we need. But the startup actually had the idea, well, since they are already build up to suck up minerals, well, why don't we make them actually suck up some type of mineral, the one that actually actually already in the soil because it's a result of pollution, but on the other side that we actually need desperately because we need it to actually build electric vehicle batteries. And so this is how it started out. And so far, I mean, they're doing great. They're actually on their pre-seed run right now. And um, I mean, it's interesting because suddenly you are taking something that we already know, we are fixing too, we are depleting the soil, and at the same time we are addressing a very important need for us to be able to address uh, you know, overgrowing market of electric mm. vehicle, which is a way of you know, getting away from fuel and finally moving towards our climate you know, agenda. So I think it's amazing and yes, in that sense, and this is just only one of the many, many examples that I could give you. Yeah, yeah. So we can actually engineer plants to do things that yeah. are useful for us and useful for the planet yeah. in the coming decades. And I've read about a startup too that is it wants to create, it's creating a new kind of tree, an engineered kind of tree that sucks more CO2 out of the air, which is amazing. I've also read about startups that want to do things like recreate the woolly mammoth. You know, <laughs> yes. recreate ancient prehistoric animals, yeah. you know, and then you start to feel like, well, you know, Should have we? you read Jurassic yeah. Park and it doesn't always end <laughs> yeah. well? This is the kind of experimentation. When you talk about engineering new kinds of plants or even engineering new kinds of animals, this is where people will start to think, is there a risk that this runs out of control? Is there a risk we create a plant or a pathogen or a gene that escapes human control and has damaging consequences 
Is that a big conversation within the synthetic biology community and, and what kind of things are being done to address those concerns if it is a big conversation? Yeah, it is definitely uh, high on the mind of everyone. I think from the general public first, because uh, as an expert, uh, I mean, if you hear a programmable life or engineered life, I mean, it sounds crazy first. And then second thought is it's dangerous. They are going to kill us all. But I, I want to be honest here, I think I've been being a scientist because I've moved away from uh, fundamental physics research to computing and now going back to biotech. Uh, as a scientist, you will always have to face that kind of fear deep down is the scientists are going to kill us all. And to be honest, there is a part of it that is not entirely, you know, false. Potentially, yeah, if we are not, uh, if we are totally unbounded and if we are not actually being careful, we could. But I think that these are very high hypothetical and that part of the synthetic biology committee work is actually also to democratize it, to talk about, it, to explain, to explain as far as we can the mechanism of what is being done. And we have actually a ethics committee. We have a lot of work that is being done, um, you know, Professor Dudna, that won actually uh, the Nobel Prize for the CRISPR-Cas9 actually discovery in the ability, you know, to really use this new type of enzyme actually to edit, you know, your mm. DNA. Mm. So she she actually is part of uh, many many research program where there is this question of ethics of what we can do and what we cannot do because obviously uh, there have been some uh, I would say errors in judgment, but also in application, if you think about uh, the latest uh, errors have been the use of CRISPR to edit uh, a, a pair of twins in China to actually um, make them potentially enhanced. And so there is a strong question around this because obviously once you start editing the genes, you are at risk of, okay, are we selecting? And so creating a different race, a different kind of humanity, who have access? What about social access? Are we, are we going to create a world where only the rich can get to live forever because they have access to this anti-aging technology that make them furthermore away from you know the masses? So obviously there is a lot of debates and questions that needs to be addressed. But I always tend to think that uh, getting shying away from something is not a way to fix it. So. You need to acknowledge that there is danger, but then you need to muscle up the courage that it takes to really face up and address and talk openly about it. And I think that yeah. it's up to the community also to make sure that you create that bridge with people so that they can understand. Because some technology might not be um, directly impactful, but some technology are. And if you think about the COVID, we have seen how people actually received and not everyone was actually entirely enthused at the idea of the vaccine. So this is just an example of how important it is to, to create this kind of communication and breaches in between what is being done and the reason why it's being done and what is the opportunity that it offers with real concern that actually people have. And I think it's valid points. Yeah, and you mentioned um, in that answer a little bit about this idea that we may in the end become something other than human. I mean, my final question, like, let's take a big question to end on, which is a huge question. You know, we're at the outset of these technologies. They will be with us for hundreds of years. You know, we're only going to discover more yeah. about this convergence between technology and biology. Do you think it's inevitable in the end that we will make changes to the human genome that cause some of us, some future humans, to become something other than human? You know, define, across- Define ac human. Yes, I mean, this is, this is what it comes down to, I suppose, is that it depends where you want to draw the boundaries around human beings. I think it's a perfect echo to uh, your keynote this morning, really, because uh, you, you mentioned that there is obviously this kind of fracture there is the one that wants to push the limit and the one that wants to be mindful and respectful and live within these limits. And I think that 
what you, you said this morning was actually, uh, I think, very interesting to me because you said there's no right or wrong. It's just a matter of offering the choice. And I think this is very beautiful because I think this is maybe the most important thing. It, it's not about um, right or wrong. It's about having the possibility, the freedom. And I think this is maybe one of the most important part. And so I think that some people would want to actually push forward. But in that case, the challenge that it will bring to our organizational system, and I'm thinking about the governance, is for them to be lean enough, fast enough in the way to understand what kind of policies need to be set in place, not to constrain one towards the other or against the other, but to allow for the two to coexist. And what kind of, what does it mean uh, in terms of organization? Does the organization need to change? And what kind of mean they need to go to follow that change? And I think the challenge is more at this level rather than saying one is better than the other. Yeah, I think that this is a great place to conclude a fascinating conversation. And I think that that, that, that is the big challenge we will face. As, as yeah, I think you've, you've articulated it perfectly, this this ability to allow people the choice when it comes to this, uh, these decisions around do we continue to push with technology, with synthetic biology and the other technologies we have, or do we, do, do we um, also allow people to, to even resist those technologies, to not want to inhabit those worlds, and we just have to navigate that, exactly as you said, navigate that conflict. Loretta, thank you so much for joining us here on the next show. It's been an absolutely fascinating conversation. So thank you. Thank you. It was amazing. Thank you. <laughs> mm.